development of ghosts here at Red Clay Tamale. Um, welcome to the final day of the public program for the solo exhibition project by Ibrahim Mahama in which opened in Germany, Osnabrück on July 8th and ended, uh, it opened with an, um, a public installation by Ibrahim Mahama from July 8th to October 1st. And we are continuing the, the exhibition in this form by traveling it from Germany to Ghana Tamale specifically, and we are here. We've been here since uh, three days ago. So we are grateful, thankful to all of you for joining us. Um, this program was intended to further complicate and expand the aesthetic, political, historical, economic, uh, cultural, dimensions or scope of the project because the project um, was dealing with three main things. It was participating in the bigger uh, festivities of the 30th anniversary of the Kunsthalle Osnabrück, which falls this year. So the invitation to Ibrahim and myself and Bettina is, uh, Bettina Klein is my co-curator. My name is Kwesi Ohenyaye. And um, we were uh, hoping that this this program would do precisely that. So the 30th anniversary, and then um, it's also responding to the history of linen production and textiles production in that region of Germany, Osnabrück. So yesterday, we listened to a lecture uh, by Professor Klaus Weber and Dr. Thorsten Heiser, who are um, historians, economic historians, who took us through the the routes, the you know, the specific commodities, the specific trade relations uh, from a pan-European uh, angle, um, and the the objects um, which were uh, traded between Germany and other European powers so, and then eventually uh, you know traveled across the Atlantic to engage more commodities so um, you know through this we are and uh, we are just generating a bigger uh, resource or pool of of resources which will contextualize Ibrahim's uh, intervention in Osnabrück uh, so that we are able to um, do a lot more and have broader conversations that implicate art or that begin with art but that transcend into different disciplines. Um, yesterday as well we heard from Professor Akosia Adomako uh, Ampofu, who took us through uh, the criticalities of uh, solidarity amongst other things. So um, we also saw interventions by Zora and her collaborators, Zora, Zora Opoku, the artist, and the revival, who took us around, um, moved us around, and staged some gestural images for us to experience. So. Uh, before I continue, I'll just say Happy Farmers Day. Today is Farmers Day in Ghana, so Happy Farmers Day. I hear it's also World AIDS Day, so let us celebrate it. Um, yeah, so the the project. Today we want to uh, take things a little bit, you know, continue the, the, the programming with Gabriel Shimeroth, who will um, 
have the first session this morning. We also have an exhibition that's opening later today. Uh, Priscilla Kennedy's work will move there. And we have a lecture also by Karika Chasidu, who will take us through his own perspectives. And uh, Koliko will also help us with their work, which is more musical in form. So I'll introduce Gabriel, who is a curator, historian, and head of public programming at the museum Am Rottenbaum Kulturen und Künste der Welt, Mark in Hamburg, Germany. He is responsible for the experimental project space Sfischen uh, Raum, a space between a space between and the project Mark in Motion, which lasted from 2018 to 2023, um, and is part of the initiative of ethnological collections of the German Federal Cultural Foundation. He was part of the interdisciplinary curatorial teams of the exhibitions Fleisch, which is flesh or meat, in 2018 at Altes Museum, um, Stettlich Museum to Berlin, Hey Hamburg, do you know Duala Mangabel, which happened in 2021 at Mark? An archive of experiences in 2022 with the Ghanaian artist Kelvin Hazel, which was part of the eighth triennial of photography ha uh, Hamburg and curated, and Gabriel has curated numerous interventions and public programs. His main areas of interest reach from the urban history and the public infrastructures to the entanglements of museum, archives, and memory politics with contemporary art. This morning, Gabriel is speaking on the 21st century reflections on the peace of Westphalia, amongst other things. Shall we give Gabriel a round of applause to begin? Yeah. Um Wonderful. Thank you, Casey, for this warm introduction. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here at Red Clay in Tamale. Um, it's a great honor. And uh, I will organize my talk roughly in three parts. So firstly, talking about the war, uh, the trauma of war, and the mismaking cultural production around it. Secondly, I will briefly talk about the Treaty of Westphalia the concept of serenity and the Westphalian system, which is huge, but also very contested implications on historiography, political science, and international relations. And lastly, linking it, linking it here in Ghana uh, with the post-colonial moment of the 19, late 1950s and 1960s, I will rely here on uh, the Ethiopian-American scholar Adam Getachev and her recently published book, World Making After Empire, The Rise and Fall of Self-Determination, by offering a brief decentering of the idea of the Westphalian system, which came after empire, going beyond the Westphalian system, and even talking about the idea of world making, which maybe could also be a starting point for further discussions here in Tamale. Um, actually, um, before going into the topic, I feel a hesitation to talk so broadly about the 30 years of war, the Westphalian Treaty, the Westphalian system. Uh, and this is mainly because I want, of course, to avoid any link in nourishing the probably inevitable idea of master narrative, which we also heard yesterday uh, about by Thorsten Hörse, is something every historian um, curator should be very reflective about. Uh, but also immediately because it is automatically lack position. The idea is instead to present a more, and even this sounds a little bit strange in the context of war, a more playful or associative intellectual history, which could be of interest here at the symposium. Um, in the two presentations yesterday by Klaus Weber and Thorsten Hese, it became clear and obvious that uh, it is impossible to think uh, domestic politics in isolation from global interactions. This is even, of course, more evident in the 19th or 20th um, century and quite frankly today. The Westphalian War is something which numerous political scientists and historians worked on. Quite lately, just 
around five years ago, the famous German political scientist Herfried Münkler made a around 800 page book, very comprehensive. And uh, I will also rely um, in this presentation on research kind of uh, brought together in this book. Starting with the war. So when the Protestant nobles toppled the governors of the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor Ferdinand uh, II from the windows of the Prague Castle in May 23, 1618, no one could have guessed um, that this was what was out, what was about to begin. The longest war on German soil and the first even European war. In the full sense of the word, it is a history where the Swedish King Gustav Adolf and the great generals such as Wallenstein and Tilly uh, were bringing in alliances, um, there were dramatic battles, unpredicted violence, and uh, what is probably the most notable, the very devastated entire landscapes, and um, of course, it uh, led to the ending came by the peace treaties in Münster and Osnabrück. Um, According to Münkler, it is also that this 30 years of war allows us to understand current wars, so the wars on the, in the present, better than any later conflict. And um, yesterday, uh, Klaus Weber was, um, when he was talking about the 30 years of war, he always spoke in the plural of it. And actually, this is also the more precise um, definition. So following today's research, it is not actually one 30 years of war, but actually there were four combined uh, wars. So the first, the Bohemian Palatine War, the Lower Saxon, uh, Saxon Danish War, the Italian Polish Interlude War, and then the Swedish War, which had the long lasting influence on the German historical understanding, but also, yeah, it is kind of like more very present in, in, in the cultural production. I will give some examples later on it. So um, the Swedish war often is portrayed as kind of like a defense of the Protestant cause um, by the Swedish, but of course, and this is obvious in a way, it, is, it was never about, only about or uh, about re a religion, but uh, for example, the Swedish uh, conquered Munich and kind of like the Catholic heartlands in um, in Bavaria, and so this was uh, not it cannot be described as defensive. Um, the memory of the Thirty Years' War was kind of like the great trauma of the Germans um, until the trauma was replaced in the collective memory by the violence and destructions uh, linked to the two world wars. So the devastation of the cities, the devastation of the country, mass deaths, ma mass deaths of the people in the years from 18, 16, 16, 18 to uh, 1648 exemplified basically the horrors of the war. But it's also that this kind of explanation is always used as an example why German history um, took a different route uh, compared to other um, European nations um, since the uh, 17th century. So this is basically like the, the idea that Germany had become the stumping ground of the armies of those powers like France, Sweden, Spain. Um, and in, in this form, it is the reason why the German nation was kind of like a belated nation among the Europeans. And so this kind of idea of the belated nation was always linked to the Thirty Years of War, and of course also traced back to the confessional divisions of the country. So uh, Germany took then this also very, in the historiography, important concept of Sonderweg or special path. Um, and while other countries had a binding confession, uh, prevailed like Catholicism in France or Protestantism in Sweden, uh, Germany be, uh, remained divided along these confessional lines. And the, even this is kind of, you can see it in, until today in Germany that there is, it, it is a multi-confessional uh, state with uh, Protestant areas, Catholic areas under the Christian population. Um, 
As a latecomer uh, in this kind of political narrative, Germany had also conquer, had to conquer its place for inside the European power dynamic. And it is, it is important that the unified wars by Prussia, so how the German nation then came about uh, in the 19th century, it was always also seen as a revision of the results of the Thirty Years' War. So also the violence inflicted on the Germans became a justification for violence now inflicted by the Germans of others. So because German, on German soil there were, this is like the, the narrative, uh, had to suffer during the 30s of war, they now can conquer France and Austria in this uh, fight on the, uh, um, on the German question or the Danish. Um, this trauma was anchored in the nation's collective memory and it became basically the justification for this aggressive stance um, and the reception that such a war on German territory has to be avoided by all costs. Briefly mentioned at the beginning that the horrors of the First and Second World War then overshadowed, overshadowed and suppressed the horrors of the Thirty Years' War and also changed, of course, the German consciousness. However, in like Catholic historiography, the Swedish king Gustav Adolf appeared as the aggressor, um, or the Protestant history, the imperial policies of Spain were played the comparable role. In principle, the decision on war and peace in this kind of Westphalian order um, then was later made uh, to the interest of the states and not in reference anymore to this kind of religious obligations or values. Um, and I think this is also something which we can take further on because it's, it's, it's of course did not eliminate it and we were talking about it um, also on the first day, uh, war in any way, right? So the, the peace of Westphalia didn't lead to an end of war, but it uh, lead to a f different form of rationalizing it, calculating it. And so in a way you could see, you could argue for, I mean, it is contested, but you could argue that the rational calculation of war is can end a war quicker than uh, if kind of like identity, religion, ambition, greed for power, religious solidarities or so are, is inter intertwined with these kind of war like it was in the 30 years of war. Um, the Peace of Australia laid the foundation of transforming this complexity uh, of the order um, in, in peace. And in today's world, and this is also something where I will later talk a little bit about persons like Münkler, but also, for example, the German president were talking about it. Um, wars in the Middle East, in the Maghreb region, or in the Sahel, Sahel region can be used as an analytic, analytical tool to understand these. I want to first bring some examples of um, the question of trauma uh, here because um, like it is often described as like um, the trauma of the 30th world of the form of tyranny, so including the forcing of uh, to force someone's religion, to force someone to, to, a, to a special religion, as a trauma of war, inflation, famine, hunger, and plagues. And this morning I was briefly talking um, yeah, with, uh, with Anna about lullabies, one of the most famous melodies basically, which in Germany commonly knows as uh, sleep, little child sleep, so schlaf, kindlein schlaf. And there are several versions which direct link, for example, to the Swedish war. And I also remember basically by my grandparents or a lot of Germans remember that they, in their childhood, came across these kind of like, 30 years war lullabies. And just to give, I mean, it's in our translation, obviously, but to give like the context of it, it's texts like, okay, the Swedish have come, took everything, broke the windows, carried the lead away, poured bullets out of it, and shot the peasants. Or um, the more kind of concrete thing with the May beetle, which is also linked then to the question of famine. May little fly, your father is at war, your mother is in um, Pomerania, Pomerania has burned down. 
um, and may block fly away. And even in kind of like my generation, for example, um, idioms like Swedish fire or behind Swedish curtains, which kind of is a description for being in jail or so, is is quite something you um, learn or you grew up with without directly linking it to kind of like a concrete concrete moment in history of the Sergius world. It's just kind of like it's a normal way of speaking and uh, it's part of, um, yeah, of uh, grow, growing up in a way until today. Or even in kind of regions where there were important political figures and what we learned about Osnabrück where this very central um, this um, Steckenpferd story where kind of like young kids going to the Rathaus in my hometown, for example, um, it was the um, it was a German count of the city who keep who kept the city out of the military conflict, and it is celebrated until today every year with a parade and so on. So, kind of like this kind of history production around the Thirty Years' War, war is kind of still relevant, um, I would argue, in Germany. Also, questions like um, around cultural production, which came after the war, and basically being the, the moment of finding peace again, is very, very central. So one of the, um, um, until now, uh, most important Protestant church songs go out my heart and seek joy by kind of like one of the main um, uh, Protestant uh, church musicians is something you roughly would say here in Protestant churches uh, almost every Sunday. So it is, um, it's something which is kind of uh, quite, quite present. Or even until today, like the Protestant church is organizing their diaspora work under actually uh, um, the structure of an, in the early 19th century, founded Gustav Adolf Werk, so named after the Swedish king, who intervened um, in Germany for the so-called uh, Protestant Church. Um, there are several, and I, I think could go on and go on for hours. Basically, there are several examples, like Grimmelshausen, one of the. Um, main descri uh, description of um, happiness and unhappiness where uh, it's, he's basically the great poet of the 30 years of war um, and um, he created figures like even Mutter Courage, also Courage which then also later 200, 300 years later were taken over by um, Bertolt Brecht or um, Kind of like poets like Andreas Gruffius, Schiller, the main um, German um, poet, and um, um, so they all kind of relied and um, and worked on these questions. And you could even go al along that even until kind of like best-selling authors of our time, persons like Daniel Kehlmann wrote a book on the Thirty Years of War, and so on and so on. Briefly to talk about the treaty so and the concept of serenity. So, moreover, the white delegates from several countries attended the Congress, uh, Congress in um, Osnabrück and Münster. The treaty was actually um, only a proper agreement between only three parties, right? It is often consisted of two treaties signed in October 48, one in Münster, one in um, uh, Osnabrück and large parts were basically um, uh, the same. So one was between the Holy Roman Empire and the Queen of Sweden and the other one was the King, the Holy Roman Empire and the King of France. And um, so large por portions of these treaties are is in a way identical and they basically talk about the internal affairs um, of this empire. Um, and Apart from this, the treaties are also concerned with certain territories awarded to France and Sweden. So the, what we know, for example, the um, Pomerania, the, the, the cut between um, Pomerania is kind of like, even until today, the state of Pomerania is, um, is linked to these kind of um, borders uh, linked through this war. And, um, 
And what is kind of what emerged out of this kind of like uh, critique on the standard account of the 48 settlement was that, um, it, it, that the 30 years of war on its nature was needed as kind of like the reprisal of the role and the concept of sovereignty. So this is something, and maybe also later when we can talk about sovereignty in the context of a post um, empire world. Uh, this is something where there's constantly referring between this Eurocentric idea of the Westphalian system and maybe a non-Eurocentric idea um, coming out of anti-colonial struggle. Um, so the sovereign state um, model was always been as kind of like a cognitive script. It was a basic rule, it was widely understood, but it was also, of course, frequently violated. So it is not that the sovereign state model was then after the treaty accepted, but it was basically with the, with the, with the treaty, it was un always under, um, under uh, pressure. And so according to this like standard view, the Thirties War was always kind of like the war between two main parties, right? the universalist actors with the emperor and the Spanish king, both from the Habsburg dynasty on the one hand, and then uh, also kind of like uh, loyal to the Church of Rome, to the Pope, um, and their uh, opponents were well, more particularist actors, specifically Denmark, the Dutch Republic, partly also French, uh, French um, as well as the German princes. And these kind of like actors rejected this imperial overlordship and also, of course, the uh, authority of the Pope and um, were instead upholding the, in the right of all states to full independence, which then led to the question of sovereignty. Um, so, maybe one few kind of um, um, more to complicate it a little bit more that the kind of dichotomy between empire and sovereignty is nowadays, so also I would say since the 1990s, um, often seen as a, as a false one. So the, the sovereignty question of the nation and the empire question, that this is kind of like a dichotomy is seen as something which is already kind of like uh, um, changed and there are new revolutionary basically phenomena. And um, what is kind of like the basic idea of the Westphalian pr principles and which is also part of what would we understand as international law. It's firstly, the government of each country is um, sovereign within its own territorial uh, jurisdiction. And on the other hand, it shall not interfere with its other domestic um, um, interest, uh, interests. So, um, um, yeah, so the Peace of Westphalia then in this case is traditionally attributed to kind of like the dignity of being the first of several attempts to establish something like a world unity order. And um, this is something which is definitely should be kind of like contested. Um, so maybe now to kind of like bring it more to the the questions which can be or should be also discussed in the context of Tamale here is um, the Westphalian order did not bring, of course, lasting peace to Europe. But it, what it did, it largely eliminated, el eliminated religious reasons for war, so the reasoning of war changed. And at least in the empire, this was kind of like an establish, established um, uh, wars as state wars for quite a long time. Um, it's also lead to the um, replacement of mercenary armies and um, the creation of more like tax funded armies, um, which also changed basically the outcome and the, um, the way how war were experienced by the population. Um, and it is also kind of an interesting question if you could argue that today we are coming back into a form of, um, in a lot of parts of the world, to a new form of imaginary uh, armies. And it's definitely something we know uh, from Northern Africa or from the Middle East or from the Sahel region that merchants are basically back 
uh, in the in the um, political debates on how to how to fight wars. And it is clear that I mean obviously after the first and second world war and the anti-colonial wars of liberation, all these principles of the Westphalian order are um, called into question. Um, when Frank Walter Steinmeier and Declare, uh, declared that the new peace of Westphalia is needed for the Middle East. Um, it, is, um, it is something where Chrissy and Bettina were also kind of like linking uh, to during their um, opening in Osnabrück. It is interesting that this kind of Westphalian peace treaty actually um, did not lead to a lasting peace, right? So there were wars over and over again, but it just changed like the structure of how the actors um, treat each other. And this is what I would love to bring now in, kind of like um, trying to to wrap it up and and um, um, bringing in kind of like a jump into the 20th century and. Um, what I was uh, referring at the be beginning about the anti-colonial nationalism, which we, for example, here in Ghana know mainly from a person like Kwame Nkrumah, and how this uh, can be actually explained as a new form of world making. So that means that um, it should require juridical, political, economic institutions in the international uh, realm and would secure non-domination. So um, the right of self-determination is often read as something, okay, the anti-colonial nationalists, they universalize the Westphalian regime of sovereignty. But um, to, to challenge this and to complicate this, um, um, uh, challenge this, um, Um, Getachev was arguing that the anti-colonial account of self-determination actually uh, marked a radical break away from the Eurocentric model of international society and established non-domination as a new and central idea of a post-imperialist world, uh, world order. Rather than the idea of independent and equal states to the legacy of Westphalia, Gedachev is arguing we should understand the vision of international order as an anti-imperialism that went beyond the demand for the inclusion of new stage um, and actually to imagine a not new form of egalitarian world order. So, and uh, I would like to, to end with this kind of like question of the retreating state in a way in the global south, as well be maybe also in the global north, that it makes any form of non-domination in the international world order even impossible. And that the minimalist defense of the state is in a strange way um, a resurrection of a Westphalian system by default. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. Ah. So the floor is open. We have about 20 minutes. We have time. So thank you again for continuing the to complicate uh, the premises of the show, you know. And yesterday, um, what um, Akosia did was to also usher us into uh, ideas or, you know, thinking about emancipatory possibilities because part of our, our interest with this program or with the show is also to, um, you know, to tap into the unconscious, violent, traumatic, uh, you know, histories or the memories that have produced the the realities we have inherited today, but at the same time, find ways of um, creating, you know, new possibilities out of this impossibility. So you have also kind of nudged us in that direction 
given us this very broad scope um, from the 17th century until until today. So grateful. Any reflections, comments? Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. It's, it set my mind thinking in many directions. And th this is not necessarily to you alone, to anyone. And when you talked about the retreating uh, state, um, and I'm thinking of t Tamales, like um, the, the Ghanaians here can correct me if I'm wrong. It's like the NGO capital of Ghana. Every pot possible non-governmental organization is here to do some kind of development, right? You see the cars, the big, the four-wheel drives driving through the city. And we've had NGOs in Tamale for decades. And yet, <laughs> you know, the development, we are not seeing it. So it's like, the, I mean, the state has retreated, obviously, and other players are supposed to do things. And I've been thinking a lot about the, the, um, the power of the creative arts. And I'm just pondering if all of you will be prophets for a moment, whether in the next years, this is where the, the power of change will be. I mean, in the last few years, we see all these competitions. And just today, Karikacha sent me something. Um, somebody else also sent me something about all these amazing things artists are doing, you know, pushing the boundaries of knowledge production, but also doing, quote unquote, very practical things in communities to sort of liberate people from something, right? Both develop developmentally, if you are thinking of water and roads and schools, but also, you know, that mental emancipation. Do we see, you know, or will the artists be co-opted into the system? So, yeah, that's that's my. Will there be more space for those kinds of things? Um, may, maybe I'm just dreaming aloud. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Are you responding to Agoja? Okay. Thank you, uh, Gabriel, for your presentation, and thank you, Prof. Edumako, for asking that question. I think maybe you are not asking if we are being, we should be prophetic, but you are also prophesizing already that, uh, yeah, probably the future to development lies in the hands of the creative arts or creative people. I mean, this edifice or this outfit. Uh, or the, the network of art, outfits that uh, Ibrahim has um, established already speak to some of these things you are saying. I think, um, I mean, um, myself and Kusi, we belong to uh, a collective, Exit Forum Collective, and um, much as we dislike <laughs> or we are suspicious of NGOs, uh, I think in the Ghanaian statutes, uh, as a collective, you cannot register if you do not present yourself as an NGO. And so we are actually registered as a non-for-profit organization just because there's no other category that cap uh, captures us. So yes, we would continue to do things, uh, but being very aware of uh, the failure of the NGO model. Uh, as you said, the the managers of these uh, NGOs would always be the ones riding in big cars. Whilst the, uh, it's the thing they refer to as poverty porn, where mm. the poverty must be maintained and must, uh, must yeah, be sustained so that aid will continue coming. Um, with the model we have here, um, the funds are expected to be generated from the activities here, not uh, for the public to pay to enter, but through the work of the artist. And so yes, the emancipation then is within the work of the artist, but the artist must be is aware of the way in which the work is made to uh, deal with the inconsistencies of capital. And then um, the emancipation then will come 
through the functions of the institution. And so, the, yes, yeah, so your, your prophecy is uh, true and is working. Uh, my question, uh, or my um, commentary uh, on um, uh, your presentation, Gabriel, is um, what you said about um, Germany's justification of inflicting violence on others because they had also received. And um, what do you speak, or how, what would you say also of the, because this, uh, this idea that violence gives birth to violence is still persistent, isn't it? Um, the current debate now with uh, is, uh, Israel and Palestine is also about this type of thing, that a certain body or a certain group um, feels almost entitled to to wreak violence on another because they have had violence in the past. How, and then there's also cause for ceasefire and things. And if the peace of Westphalia did not bring lasting peace, how are we guaranteed <laughs> that even if the ceasefire happens, there will continue to be peace? Uh, <laughs> I, I hope you can deal with it. Thank you. A very difficult question. I will. But please, you don't have to answer. Yeah, so I will answer shortly. I wanted to also say one one uh, one sentence to the question of NGO, um, because it, the NGO is coming, like the NGO in cultural arts or in kind of like humanitarian aid, is coming kind of uh, late. And this is a quote I didn't include in the presentation. Um, but I was uh, yesterday talking briefly with uh, Katja Seydu about it, that there is, it's a kind of like a paper from the 1980s, um, also on the question of uh, how Africa is trapped, and it, it, would, it would be interesting how it is, how it is maybe seen today, but how Africa was trapped in the 1980s between the Westphalian concept of the nation state and the sovereignty, and the transnational concept of capitalism and um, and this kind of like didn't work together so that the Westphalian system in a way inflicted um, also a lot of um, kind of pressure on the um, economic um, deprivation and so on and so on. Um, in regard to the question um, of what I said was uh, Germany, or the, 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 the Germany um, was arguing in the 19th century um, that they, infl they, um, they um, uh, that on German soil there were this kind of uh, 30 years of war, and that's the reason why they are now be able to fight the Danish, the Austrian, the French in the 19th century as a um, late coming of um, of the nation state. This is, of course, and I mean, if we if we're looking at from today, also a form of propaganda or a question of. Um, of um, history production, um, which then wanted to explain why um, the Prussian-led German state was uh, in a form very aggressive or seen as very aggressive. Um, the linking what you what you then made to kind of like current debates in Israel-Palestine is kind of something which I would say is in this kind of specific course, very different because, the, like I said in the beginning, the First and Second World War of the 20th century, they really transformed also the understanding of the 30 years of, um, 30 years of war. Right? So it's kind of like what I, how I described it um, and also how uh, kind of like scholars like Munkler is describing um, it. It is... Um, it is, it, is, it is more about how the, uh, the Westphalian system and how the 30 years of war became such a trauma to the German nation. Why I talked about the kind of lullabies uh, which are still on uh, today, but there's, there was also kind of like a, an understanding that um, something like this should not have happened again um, uh, during the war. And it could be, for example, that even 
something like the Westphalian Peace Treaty in uh, in Germany uh, in the in the 20th century, it was also linked that it's we should avoid of on all costs that kind of like the war is going on inside the German um, areas, right? So this is also something which is which was always very very present um, in it, and um, yeah, I think. I mean, it goes without saying that these kind of like, there are no um, um, forms of, okay, uh, because of this war we can do this, or because we endure this, we can do this. And um, also in kind of like history, maybe this is more like, I answered in a, on a more uh, theoretical level, kind of like history um, production is always going, is, when, you can, when, when history is written, it's always written with a day uh, with yesterday evening in mind, right? So it is something which is constantly um, it, it, something which is constantly rewritten, and um, this also then lead to examples that um, you um, you use kind of like historical experience to argue for something like this. But this is obviously not a um, you cannot you cannot bring in the the concept of truth in it. Yeah, um, I want you to develop that a little bit further. Um, w when you mentioned uh, uh, the world-making uh, with the contrasting the um, effects, so out of the Westphalian system, you have a you have a Eurocentric model that uh, has been operating in its own way. And then you have, uh, from the mid-century um, liberation movements, you have anti-colonial nationalist models, which also uh, harking back uh, to, to the Westphalian system in some way. How do you develop that contrast a little bit for us? Yeah, so I, like I said, I'm mainly relying here on this um, very great book, um, World Making um, After Empire. Um, and I think what is interesting in her perspective is there was, especially kind of like in international relations and in political science, um, uh, a long-lasting conception that um, decolonization processes are basically a buying into the Westphalian system. So we want to become sovereign states. We want to be present at the United Nations or then before League of Nations. And in this kind of like concept, we, um, we are creating independence and sovereignty and, um, yeah, frankly, decolonization. Um, but um, her argument of world making, so world making, the definition of world making, what she's kind of doing is basically anti colonial nationalism. So uh, this is something like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, but you had several other, Tanzania, you had in the Caribbean also um, uh, processes like this. And in the Anglophone world, there was the moment that um, there was a different understanding of um, what kind of like the future world order should be. And the main argument was not participating in kind of like the United Nations as a sovereign state or to be part with the sovereign nation in this kind of like uh, international world order, but to create a new form of world order which is on the funda fundamental basis of non-domination. And I think this is very, uh, very, very interesting. And I was reading in when I was reading for this and, and reading a lot of uh, articles um, for this presentation, uh, even for uh, from the 1950s or from 19, late 1940s on, you have every basically every 10 years political science historians, um, um, politicians who were referring to the Westphalian system. This is really like it's a. It's an upcoming, an upcoming um, um, everlasting concept in a way. And even, for example, someone like Carl Schmidt, this kind of like um, 
important um, German theorist who's kind of like was one of the main influential figures in, in German fascism, but also got kind of like referred by Giorgio Agamben, for example, and so on. So it's a quite problematic um, until, um, uh, scholar, and he was also referring on the Westphalian system. So this is something which is from basically the whole 20th century, the Westphalian system is was very, very um, present. And to kind of understand the anti-colonial deliberation, um, the decolonization processes, not as a attempt to um, um, to be, be becoming part of a, of, a, of, a, of a system, but actually changing it on, on a more fundamental level um, is something which I thought also is very, can be very fruitful for, um, for discussions what an artwork by Ibrahim Mahama, maybe also like the whole idea of an anniversary of 375 years, um, of the Westphalian Peace Treaty can actually <laughs> on, uh, mean for us today in a, here in Ghana, but also more broadly. So um, that's the reason why I brought um, in her, um, her recently published um, book, because I, I think it's, um, it's, it was for me very, um, um, it was a very hands-on, um, non-eurocentric approach um, to uh, to question of international relations. Thank you, Gabriel. Do we have any more? We have room for one more. Okay. We are squarely on our break time, our lunch break time. So thank you once again. Please let's show some love to Gabriel. Thank you for coming, for offering us these uh, critical reflections. Um, we'll be back in an hour here. Then we listen to Priscilla Kennedy, who will take us through uh, some of her thoughts, the processes. Eventually, we go with her to experience the work. Thank you.